I'm Gary Hooser. Uh, this is my backyard, and um, I've lived on Kauai since 1980. I became really aware of local politics, and I ran and I lost. Uh, but then I ran again and won my first uh, term on the county council. I was in the Hawaii State Senate for eight years. Four of those were majority leader. I run for lieutenant governor. I, I lost, and then the director of the Office of Environmental Quality. But it wasn't for me. So I decided to run for the Kauai County Council. And that's where this whole Bill 2491 started. I was the right guy at the right time. So I had eight years in the Senate. I had my environmental quality experience. I dealt with guys in suits before. They didn't intimidate me. And so I'm running for council, and when you're, when you're campaigning, you knock on doors, you talk to people. And people kept telling me, Gary, you know, we're concerned about these GMO companies on the west side. Gary, my cousin's getting sick. My daughter's got asthma. She never had asthma before. This isn't just my hippie, howly environmental friends, right? These are local residents, plantation people. And then, then I found out a community in Waimea was suing Pioneer Seed. You don't sue the boss, usually, not in these communities. Dust blowing off the fields and people getting sick on their block. People are going door to door counting cancer cases. It's incredibly hard, if not impossible, to prove direct causation in a small community. You know that those guys in those fields are spraying stuff that's poisonous. It says it causes cancer and it causes all this bad stuff. But to prove that that stuff sprayed half a mile away is causing the cancer in this little boy or this old man over here is, is almost impossible. In Waimea County Middle School, there'd been at least three instances where kids got sick, were taken to the hospital, throwing up, and eyes burning. And we've got teachers with videotapes seeing the machines going back and forth. It was never proven to be pesticides. The company said it was stinkweed. I got elected and people expect me to do, what are you gonna do? So we sat in, in Saul's living room, which is not too far away from here, and uh, Fern Holland uh, was there and a few other people. And they said, you know, you gotta help us. And I told them, I said straight up, I said, you know, I'm only a councilman. I can't get rid of these companies even if I wanted to. I don't have the legal power to kick them out. I'll, I'll let me think about it. Uh, and they said, okay, well, if you take some action, we'll be there and back you up. We'll, st we'll support it. I went to the companies, and then there's four of them, four of the largest chemical companies in the world, DuPont, Dow, Syngenta, and a company called Bex. And so we met the council chambers. They said, there's nothing to worry about. All we're doing is what every other farmer does. I said, you know, okay. I said, you know, but could you tell me what chemicals you're using? Uh, and they said, no. And I said, you know, you say it's safe, but you won't tell me what, what you're using. Sorry. And then they lied to me over and over again, because I did some, my research, and I found out that they're, they're using what they call restricted use pesticides, which is a higher level. You need federal permits for it. They're really, really bad stuff. There's stuff that's banned in other countries, Paraquat. Atrazine, chlorpyrifos, and they say, well, we follow the label, and some of these labels are 100 pages long, and I'm not exaggerating. Skulls and crossbones. The other farmer uses this much. They're using by the ton over and over again, because uh, we have three growing seasons here. And I went back to my group, and I said, okay, maybe I could put a, a, a bill that requires them to disclose. And they say, that sounds good, but it's not enough. <laughs> so I said, okay, well, maybe with buffer zones. You gotta tell us what you're doing and you can't do it around schools, hospitals, and houses. Yes. And they thought, okay, that sounds good. Well, that's not enough. Uh, and they're doing experimental growing of crops. They're shipping corn seed out that says not fit for human consumption. They're, they're growing stuff that you need a federal permit that says not for release into the environment. They're growing in open air fields. Okay, so what, birds get it or pigs eat it or we eat the pigs. So I added on, uh, the experiments have to be done inside. Do it in a greenhouse, guys. Don't do it open air. You know, I'm trying to be reasonable. And then um, we put a moratorium. And until we do an environmental health study, you, know, you just can't do more. Oh, we had uh, attorneys, uh, county attorneys, as well as attorneys from the Center for Food Safety and Earth Justice helping us, advise us on the language. So I introduced that bill. We introduced it, and you would have thought the world was coming to an end. Uh, these companies just blew it up. They went and they told all their employees, Hoosers gonna put you out of business. These anti-GMO activists are gonna close us all down, it's gonna cost you your job, you're gonna not be able to pay your mortgage. Yeah. And so there was this immediate fear and uh, divisiveness, way more than it had to be. We proceeded to have hearings, and they were the, the, the largest public hearings held in the history of Kauai. Hearings, and the companies continued to lie to us. 
uh, you know, they would say that it's safe. Well, it's clearly not safe. Why are you guys wearing full body suits when they're applying this stuff, you know? Why does it say, you know, keep away from people and living creatures on the label? You know, so it's not safe. And well, this is going to keep us from feeding the world. When we started, there was cornfield from the airport all the way to Poly Holly, pretty much as far as you could see behind the college, across in the supermarket, everywhere there's corn. And none of that corn is for human consumption. Not a, any of it. It's for cattle feed. I got to find this stuff out. They don't tell you this. Cattle feed, high fructose corn syrup, or ethanol. You don't feed the world with Snicker bars and beef. They tell you stuff like, well, we're already highly regulated. Well, maybe. I went to look, I'm going to look at them. And the guy was embarrassed and says, well, I'll give you the key. And, but, you know, we never look at these things. I open the room, and cardboard box has never been opened, and then when you open them, it's mostly redacted anyway. Yeah. And it'll tell you where those permits are, where they're growing stuff that they're not supposed to release into the environment. So we had this, this series of hearings, and, and uh, the companies are busing their people in. People are concerned about the industry had red shirts, the industry had blue shirts. It was mostly civil, but got a little bit antagonistic sometimes. And then in the front row would be the four or five executives of these companies and their attorneys. One of the main guys, I believe he was with Syngenta. I can't figure this out, you know. I said, all we're asking for is disclosure and buffer zones. You say it's safe. Why are you fighting us so hard on this? And he said, council member, you don't understand. He said, we're concerned that other communities might want to do the same thing. And I was so mad. I'll tell you, I was so mad. And I got sarcastic. I said, so other communities might want to protect their schools and their kids and stuff too? And he looked at me and I said, you know, I get it. So you get to know these executives a little bit. I said, you know, I just, I just got it. You guys aren't making the decisions, right? Chicago or New York or Amsterdam or wherever, those guys are calling the shots. Your council member, they're watching the meeting right now. Because it was all live streamed, yeah? The first march, Poipu. So I'm a council member, and I, I'm not really into marching. To quite honest, I had never really marched before in, in terms of activism. So I drove to Poipu undecided and it starts raining. So I park, you get this visualization of your, your windshield going back and forth, and I look down the road, and these guys are marching in the rain, and they're wet, and they're scraggly, and, and it makes you so proud, right? They're there, they don't need me. Uh, they're there, they're marching, they're carrying their banners, and uh, they kept marching all the way through. They, that group grew, and, and there was thousands of people. I wanna, I wanna say four or 5,000 people marched in Lihui on Rice Street in a community that has 65,000 people. I mean, it's just, it was massive. A lot of Native Hawaiians, a lot of environmentalists, a lot of people, because what we're doing is pulling back the curtain, okay? These hearings were all televised, uh, and you could see these guys lying to us. Emotional roller coaster. People would go the day before and get in line because the room is full, and people are they're busing their people in, so we can't get a seat, our guys. And one night, never forget, it's, it's nighttime, it's raining sometimes, and there's, we have a line of people, sleeping bags or whatever, on the sidewalk out in front of the county building. My son, Dylan. So he calls me, he says, Dad, the police just showed up. They want to know who's in charge. So I call another young lady. She says, no one's in charge. That's what you tell them. No <laughs> one's in charge. <laughs> and she says, this is an organic movement. So I tell my son. I said, cool. <laughs> so we meet on Wednesdays. So on Tuesday, I'm there going to my office, and I see in front of the council offices of the steps four or five people who look kind of down and out. And, and I, I, I saw this one fella, uh, Tyler, and he's got real thick glasses. His nickname is a professor. I said, oh yeah, professor, how you doing? Because he'd been to my house before. And I said, so what, what are you doing here? Yeah, nothing. He said, why? I said, well, there's going to be, you know, we're having the hearings and stuff. And to make a long story short, my son got there a little bit later and he talked to Tyler. And the companies were paying these guys to hold a space in line. And Tyler sees all his friends in red shirts. And then he finds out what's going on. And he said, no, I'm not gonna do this. He ended up going in and testifying and telling a story and he got a standing ovation. The crowd just ripped and, and roared. And for a moment, he was a hero. Among, for me, for my son, for all those people there, he did the right thing. And I'm, I'm sure he's never going to forget that. And Saul Khan tells me that changed Tyler's life. That he's, uh, he's married now, he's got a kid, he's got his life together. But those are the kind of things that happen all through this thing. You know, heroes stepping forward. Was these people were counting on me. 
You know, they really were counting on me, and, and you don't want to let them down. You don't want the whole system to let them down. You know? <laughs> I would purposely, before a meeting, stack a bunch of books and stuff up and put little yellow tickers, tabs. <laughs> <laughs> and then once in a while, I'd reach over, I'd pull one out, I'd go, and then I'd, you know. I mean, I knew, I knew the data. I knew the data, but that was the theater. When I first started this thing, they weren't paying their property taxes. I'm, I don't make this stuff up. They weren't paying their taxes. So they said, well, we don't have to pay the taxes. I said, no, the law says. So they had to pay a quarter million in back taxes because we found them out. We, so we have a meeting with 10 people, maybe. What are we going to do, guys? We're losing. And then we figure out, okay, we got, we got to find a scientist. Let's go find a doctor that we know who's from Harvard and got credentials who will testify. And there's no shortage of data to support us, but we had to go find it and pull it in. Yeah, at the end of the day, we had Dr. Uh, Evslin, uh, who's, uh, who's a head of the, former head of the hospital, a uh, board-certified pediatrician. Right. I have an email, and this is public, from a doctor at uh, Koi Veterans Memorial Hospital on the west side who said, I deliver babies, and I've been delivering babies in this town for four or five years, and I've never seen this many birth defects of a certain kind in newborns than ever, and I've worked in all kinds of other places. Uh, and several other doctors said the same thing. And this is a hospital right next to the fields where the kids got evacuated. This is in the heart of the community. This is where the workers go, this is where the community goes. And I, I have an audio tape of a surfer who I didn't know from Adam. He's coughing and said, Gary, I just got to my car. I had to paddle in because I couldn't stay out in the water. This is a poly holly. He said the smell was outrageous, I couldn't breathe. And he's coughing and he said, when I got to my car or when I got back to the land, I see Syngenta uh, spray trucks out there. They just finished spraying because the wind just blows out to sea. And he's a, he's a mile out, probably. Dur during that time, yeah. you know, I got the email. We've been following your, your battle on Kauai against Syngenta. Syngenta is based in Basel, where he lives. He says, I'm part of this group. It's called MultiWatch. And their mission is to hold international corporations based in Switzerland accountable for their, their work overseas. And we own a couple of shares said, and we'll put one in your name, and you get on the list, every shareholder can talk. And I, and I knew what I wanted to say. I said, you know, imagine if you live where I live. Imagine if you live there. For me. And you know, the stuff they're using in my town is against the law to use in your town. You know, atrazine, you can't use atrazine in Switzerland. Yep. I said, imagine that. And so I think the people got it. The audience got it. The board of directors didn't get it. They didn't like it, but, and I kept talking. And then finally, the board of directors told me to, sh to be quiet. I've had enough. Sit down. Politics 101, majority rules. Seven council members. And we need four, guys. There, it was a 13-hour meeting or something. I was something crazy. I, I get them mixed up. But it was a long meeting. It was the end of the night. This might have been November, I think. But in January, the legislative session starts. And it's an election year. And I knew if we didn't pass this thing, they're going to use that excuse. We'll let the state deal with it or let the, you know. So as a chair, I knew not to recess the meeting. No, we're here. We're here until we're done. So all but one, I believe, voted for it. So we passed the bill. The first time in history that any legislation like this has been passed regulating these companies where the companies are based. And we were happy, you know, we were, we were really, really happy. Uh, it was, I'll never forget it. Yeah. Everybody worked hard. I mean, thousands of people worked hard. There's people in the room worked hard and we were on the right side and we won. And then within days, I believe, the mayor vetoed it. Mayor Carvalho. And there's pictures of him holding hands with the company executives out on the front lawn, standing in a circle. And I just think he believes what I used to, that, that rich people or people in suits must be smarter than everybody else. They, they wouldn't be lying to us. So then Nadine Nakamura was a council member, resigned from the council to go to work for the mayor. So we lost a vote. Uh -huh. We need five. And there's only six of us there. So, but we had a hearing. We had a hearing to override the mayor's veto. The process for selecting the seventh, the remaining six are supposed to vote. Pick somebody to sit in that seat, but we hadn't done that yet. So I talked first to, to dampen all the opposition's arguments, because I know what they're gonna be. This stuff is safe, you know, the same stuff we're feeding the world. So I counter all their arguments strongly. And then after myself, we go around the room. And Ross Kagawa, council member Kagawa was the second to the last to talk. And as soon as he started talking, you could hear people started crying. You knew we don't have the votes. Yeah. If you're gonna lose the vote, you don't vote. Okay. I mean, that's a political thing. If you, yeah. can, if you can call a recess or you just do something, you do not let that vote happen. 
he finishes talking and I raise my hand. And you're only supposed to speak once. And the chair looks at me and says, you know, what? And, I'm, and I say, and I meant it dearly, I said, you know, this decision's too important for six people. The ch county charter says seven council members represent the community. Recess this whole meeting until we appoint a seventh council member. Uh -huh. So we did. Yeah. And Mason Chalk, uh, council, now council member Chalk, and no one knew. I didn't know how he was going to vote. Again, Sunshine Law won't let you talk to people about this. We go around the room again, and he, get, he, he opens his mouth, and he says, you know, the last 48 hours have been the, this, this incredible barrage of, of information and stuff. And he said, now I have to vote on this. And he said, you know, and, and if I'm going to err, I want to err on the side of the safety of children. And I'm going to support And then the crowd just erupted, and it was like, boom. So we overrode the veto, so it's high, low, high, low. Wow. Uh, wow. Changed Mason Chalk's life, he never, it's like a baptism of fire. Uh, <laughs> sure. So then Syngenta, Dow Chemical, DuPont, and Bex, uh, they sued the county. For what? Uh, they said we didn't have the legal authority to pass the law. And um, we made a big banner. It said, shame on you, suing Kauai County for the right to spray poisons next to schools and not, talk, not tell us about it. That's how I felt, that's how I feel today. Shame on you, you know. It got referred to a federal court. Federal court ruled that only the state has the legal authority to regulate pesticides in Hawaii. That's what they call implied preemption. There was no law that said that. There was no other court case that ever said that. It was an open question. Our state constitution says the state and all of its subdivisions have to protect the health and the environment. We tried to get the state Supreme Court to, to hear it and we weren't able to do that. Uh, so we lost, and that uh, was one of the darkest days of my, my life, you know, kind of thing. A lot of people, uh, it was sad, and we worked so hard. Uh, so we lost, and we filed an appeal. Uh, we lost the appeal, uh, and then we roll up our sleeves, say, okay, guys, let's go to the state. And after three years, we passed the first of the nation ban on chlorpyrifos. Chlorpyrifos is a neurotoxin. It causes brain damage in kids. There's, it's unquestionable. The EPA has already banned it inside, and uh, we banned it completely in, in Hawaii. And we put in buffer zones for schools, small ones, 100 feet, uh, which is not enough. And the bill also requires disclosure statewide, not just for Kauai. So that's the bill we passed. It wouldn't happen without those group of people in that living room and the whole thousands of people marching. They will never admit that the work we did impacted their industry here. Mm -hmm. But today, the actual records show that they are farming between a third and a half of the acreage they did when we started our work. Awesome. They now have big, huge greenhouses that they do inside work. They didn't have those greenhouses before. They are uh, using you know, a third to a half of, of the pesticides if they're doing a third to the half of the, of the, of the stuff. And their, their economic footprint is also less than half. So they've moved their business out. They've all changed their names, but I, I am clear that if not for the work of our community, that this wouldn't happen. It's not enough, we need to do more. I talk about the man under the bridge. There's people living under the bridge because they can't afford a job, they can't find a job, or they don't have teeth. And you can't, you can't get a job pushing carts at Walmart without teeth. And there's no insurance, no health insurance for them. The disparity between the, the rich and the poor, that keeps me awake at night. Seeing the, uh, the outrageous, egregious sadness of the injustice. There's an urgency that is shared by most people, but not shared enough by the people who set public policy. And my hope is to, uh, again, motivate people who share that urgency. I used to have a, a rock, and it's somewhere in the garage in a box, you know, things wind up. And it said, never, never quit. And that's my, my mantra, if you would. Uh, for perseverance.